Hello, I'm Joe Larkins. And I'm Natalie Chandler. Welcome to this edition of Your Family Pet. On tonight's show, we report on a veterinarian who uses acupuncture and natural healing to treat sick and injured animals. You'll get tips on keeping a snake as a pet, and we'll explore alternatives to declawing your cat. And we'll give you a consumer's guide to choosing the right pet food. All this and much more on this edition of Your Family Pet. Production funding for Your Family Pet is made possible in part by Memphis Veterinary Specialists, a referral-based specialty hospital serving the needs of small animals, offering diagnostic tools and treatment options not typically found outside veterinary teaching hospitals, including orthopedic and neurologic surgery, oncology, dermatology, dentistry, ophthalmology, internal medicine, and more. And by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. For thousands of years, the Chinese have been practicing various forms of natural healing, including acupuncture. Here in America in the 1970s, a group of veterinarians began using acupuncture and other natural therapies on animals. Today, there are about 2,000 veterinarians practicing alternative healing methods on our pets. Chris Hardaway reports on Dr. Kathy Michener, who uses acupuncture, laser treatments, and water therapy to rehabilitate sick and injured animals. Dr. Kathy Michener is inserting acupuncture needles into a 10-year-old Weimaraner named Cole. Cole has a story to tell, but more about that later. Dr. Michener has been a practicing oncologist since 1988, but her disenchantment with the prescribed cancer treatments of chemicals, surgery, and radiation pushed her to seek an alternative. I was tired of sitting with lovely people and telling them, well, I can either poison it, we can carve it out, or we can fry it, and I had to have something else. And a friend of mine said, why don't you try something and he used the word crazy. And I said, well, sure, what, do you, what would you suggest? He said, well, try something like acupuncture because it's a different tool that you can add to what you're doing. She trained in Colorado and began incorporating her newly learned tools into her practice here. I had no idea how potent that form of therapy would be. There is not a medical condition that I can't justify the use of acupuncture for. So I use it primarily for pain and musculoskeletal disorders. We use it for paralysis, we use it for seizure, we use it for organ disorders, liver failure, kidney failure. We use it to modulate the bone marrow. It improves energy, decreases anxiety, and generally improves quality of life. This is PJ, and he is a canine athlete competing on agility courses. But the rigors of his training and competition have left him with musculoskeletal issues. Dr. Michener combines acupuncture with exercise on an underwater treadmill. PJ does two 25-minute sessions every week. We wanted to work with his muscles just to get him to relax in the water, to use his muscles more completely without that pounding of the agility work. And then now we've got the pain under control, he's moving better, his muscles are working better, and now we're working on conditioning him. And here's Max. A few weeks ago, he was hit by a car and he dislocated his left hip. The top of his femur had to be removed and now he has what is termed a false joint. In order to get those false joints to act normal again, they need to be rehabilitated. And the best and the quickest way to rehabilitate them is to put them on a treadmill. And then with the water, we make them buoyant so that they, can, they don't have to bear as much weight, but they get good extension and we can bring back range of motion in that leg quicker. Max's prognosis is good. But he, within a couple of months, should be back to moving normally again. Cole sits quietly as Dr. Michener inserts more acupuncture needles. At a young age, Cole suffered a spinal embolism that paralyzed his hindquarters. At the time, the vet gave him a 10% chance of survival and recommended that he be put down. But Dr. Michener had other ideas. 
Dr. Mishner said, let me have six weeks with him and I think I can have him walking. And we all were, you know, I was a little skeptical, I'll be honest, but um, was like, we got to try it. Let's try it. You know, it can't hurt. Let's try it. We had a party for him six weeks later and he was walking. Cole's story seems like a miracle, and maybe it is. But Dr. Michener believes that using alternative techniques alongside traditional veterinary medicine can yield remarkable results. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're allowing the body to make the body better. Instead of putting a chemical on top that's masking symptoms or changing the way the body processes um, information, we're using the body to make the body better. He's truly a miracle. He truly is a miracle. Whether you like them or loathe them, snakes are fascinating creatures. For some people, that fascination leads to the desire to own a pet snake. But which snake should you choose? And how do you properly care for an animal that has such a unique set of requirements? Recently, I talked with Andy Williams of the Lichterman Nature Center about the do's and don'ts of snake ownership. Thanks for coming on the show, Andy. Um, go ahead and tell me about the snake you have. This is a normal phase corn snake. Uh, you might even find uh, this in your backyard and barns and that sort of stuff. They're called corn snakes, not because they eat corn, but because they have uh, markings that look like uh, uh, rows of corn in you know, uh, Indian corn and such. Yeah, they really do. But you know, on the family pet, I thought this would be a good explanation. This is one of the three uh, types of snakes that if you want a snake as a family pet, that we would recommend that you get. Okay, um, so if I did want this snake as a pet, what type of habitat would it need to have? What kind of things would I need to buy to make sure it's got the right environment? The first thing you need to do when you're thinking about a snake is uh, this one or any other, is this a good uh, choice for you? You know, they can live like 20 years or more. And, uh, you know, the family hamster or gerbil maybe just live a few years. Mm -hmm. you've got to, uh, if you're getting this for the kids, you've got, to be, you've got to consider it that you would still be taking care of this while the kids are in college and starting their own family. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real long-term commitment. Uh, but the, the size of the enclosure is uh, important, but also with snakes, you've got to make sure it's escape-proof. They're escape artists. They can get through amazingly small holes and out of tight places really easily. I bet. So whatever container that you use, it's got to be easy to clean, but most importantly, escape proof. With the snake, the most common enclosure is a specially made snake aquarium. It's like a standard aquarium, but it has a top that clamps on very securely so the snakes can't get out. Okay. Uh, most hobbyists used heating pads. Uh, you can buy them at drugstores, but uh, I recommend getting specially made reptile heating pads that go underneath the tank. Okay. And so uh, you've got the tank bottom, on, you have the heating pad on one side, typically the water dish on the other side. You'll have the tank bottom covered with something that we refer to as a substrate. It can be as simple as a newspaper or paper towel, or you can uh, go to the pet shop or online sources of reptile supplies and come up with more elaborate, you know, bark-like substrates and that sort of stuff that can be uh, easily cleaned. As I mentioned, they need a water dish and a hide spot. Uh, the hide spot is, uh, uh, you know, basically they have a need for security. This is a, a simple hide spot, just it's, it's, it's artificial. And actually this snake, when it was uh, uh, first hatched, was only about eight or t 10 inches long and could very easily fit into that. Oh, wow. Uh, this particular s snake's habitat is about 55 gallons. Okay. And so you can imagine if he was five times the size. Yeah, that he mm -hmm. would not be large enough yeah. for him. <laughs> also, we're miss, uh, not mentioning before now, they've got to eat. And uh, what do you think they eat? Uh, probably something that was once alive. <laughs> it is something that was once alive, exactly. They're carnivores. In the wild, they'll eat other snakes. They'll eat lizards. When they're young, they'll eat insects. And they'll eat rodents. In fact, uh, that's, you find these around barns. Uh, we feed uh, our snakes at the Nature Center all uh, uh, pre-killed, uh, frozen uh, 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 mice, rats, and sometimes even uh, birds that we buy from a, a reptile uh, distributor. Okay, so you don't want to just go outside, catch a mouse, and give it to your snake. You, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go to buy a mouse and feed it to your snake. These, particularly the long-term captives, are not accustomed to uh, eating their prey, and they, uh, uh, or eating live prey, rather, and they don't eat as frequently as we do. Uh, this one's fed about once a week, larger snakes, uh, every other week, a month, or sometimes every other month. It mm -hmm. just depends on the snake's uh, 
uh, how hungry it is, how well they eat, and uh, this sort of thing. You don't want to necessarily pet your snake like you would a dog or cat. They're much different than that yes. type of pet. Yeah, they think like reptiles. You know, uh, if you have a pet dog or cat, they're mammalian, and although they don't think like we do, you get a more sense of, of that. Plus, they've been domesticated for so so long that uh, the dogs and cats we have today really want to give back and look mm -hmm. for opportunities. The snake uh, don't think along that line. Their brains are great at being snakes and such. However, uh, their main uh, motivations have to do with conservation of energy, mm -hmm. eating, and frankly, reproduction. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, they're largely content, uh, except for uh, little runs around their tank uh, at dawn and dusk, to stay in their hide book, box and just in enjoy their life. So this is another snake you might suggest somebody could have as a pet at their home. Exactly. Well, this is actually another corn snake. It's the same uh, genus and species as the one we uh, just looked at. Okay. But uh, this color morph or color way is called a creamsicle. And they have uh, uh, selectively bred. Basically, uh, its parents had these uh, color aspects. And much like people used to breed or still do dogs and cats for specific uh, uh, you know, superficial differences in, in appearance, they've done the same thing with snakes. Okay. And you said this one along with what other types of snakes would make a good pet? Okay, well this, the, the native corn snake, the, uh, uh, king snakes and milk snakes, which are closely related, mm -hmm. there are a variety of beautiful naturally occurring uh, variations in milk snake uh, patterns. You know, they're the orange and black. Uh, they look somewhat like the venomous coral snake. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's the mimicry is caused for confusion in the wild. The other snake that we highly recommend for pets is a ball python. Mm -hmm. Their ball pythons are probably the most uh, popular pet snake in, in the country, and good reason. Uh, they're easy to take care of, they're docile. All right, well, thank you for all that great information about snakes, and we really appreciate having you on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Our breed of the month is the Chihuahua. Although the exact origin of the Chihuahua is unknown, it was first discovered in Mexico and brought to America by Spanish traders. The Chihuahua gained popularity in the 1900s and has been one of the most popular breeds ever since. The Chihuahua is the smallest dog breed in the world, recognized by most kennel clubs. The breed can be divided into two varieties based on their coat, either short hair or long hair. The coat itself can vary from solid white to solid black with spots or in a variety of patterns and colors. Coat care is minimal for the short-haired variety, but the long-haired Chihuahua needs attention multiple times a week. The Chihuahua is an indoor dog preferring warmer regions. They are less tolerant of cold weather and may require a sweater or boots. It's not uncommon to see Chihuahuas trembling from the cold or from stress or excitement. Chihuahuas can be picky eaters, and they also have problems with dental issues, making adequate care of their teeth a necessity. The breed is also prone to some neurological diseases, such as epilepsy or seizure disorders. Chihuahuas are known for their varied temperament, and they tend to be fiercely loyal to one particular guardian. In some cases, they may become overprotective of this person, especially when they're around other people or animals. Though at times chihuahuas are shy and reserved towards strangers, they are generally friendly with other household dogs and pets. They typically display a protective nature by barking and therefore should not be used as a guard dog. This breed is generally described as sassy due to its attitude and lively expressions. The chihuahua's lifespan is between 12 and 20 years. Many times cat owners are concerned about scratching, whether it's their furniture or even people. And today we have Dr. Russ Drury from Wolf Chase Animal Hospital on the show and his cat Timmy. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. And we've got my cat Mo. And it looks like you brought some items here today. So if you want to go ahead and tell us about them. Sure. First, you know, when, when we're having problems with cat scratching, whether it's furniture, people, mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing we try to do first is give them something that they can scratch. 
um, that's appropriate, you know, and not not a um, not their furniture, not the rug, not not their owners. Um, so the first thing that we usually try to do, and the easiest thing for an owner to do, is give them a scratching post, uh, usually a medium that they really like to scratch. Mm -hmm. There's several there's several options out there. The, the most common one that we'll see um, is going to be the carpet covered ones. One like this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's going to be the most common that you'll get. I find though that that's probably the the one that they actually like to scratch the least. Mm -hmm. The two things that I see cats like to scratch the most are your cardboard ones and they have removable inserts too so when they tear them all up you can put a new one in. Okay. Um, or actually even um, our feline behaviors at school recommended even bringing in some wood from the outdoors. You know a lot of cats like that that texture. Um, awesome. You gonna leave Tim? Bye, Timmy. <laughs> so um, even with these uh, with these with these cardboard ones, you can they're corrugated, and you can put in a little bit of catnip into those into those kind of crevices there. Okay. And those will help get them used to that and get them actually wanting to scratch that scratching post. I and mean, I see you have the clippers here, and that kind of perhaps helps with their urge to scratch or makes the nail Ex duller. Exactly. So the cat's nail actually curls over pretty sharply. Okay. Um, so and that that very tip is what they're going to use to to actually cause damage to furniture and actually cause damage to people. So the um, the easiest way I think is actually just to trim your cat's nails about every two weeks depending on the the nail growth. Okay. So this is my favorite type of trimmer. Um, the ones the guillotine ones I've seen more accidents with. Okay. There is a um, there is a a nail bed, a very vascular part of the nail bed that's actually pink, mm -hmm. um, that if you trim that, they can bleed. Um, also, I want to always warn owners, if, if you're having, if your cat is actually going to scratch you, bite you, claw you, just stop. You know, it's not worth, it's mm -hmm. not worth getting, getting, um, getting bit over. Okay, and I also see the soft claws on the table. Can you tell me a little bit about them? Yeah, so soft claws are soft, and they also have soft paws. They're actually little, little rubber tips that you can, that you can actually glue onto the nail. Okay. Usually we recommend clipping them first because they don't, um, they don't glue well onto a, an intact nail, mm -hmm. but if you just trim off the very sharp portion, um, they, the package includes um, usually two sets of them along with the adhesive. So what you'll do okay. is put a little bit of the adhesive in each little, um, each little, uh, little paw, mm -hmm. a little, little gap. And then you slide that over their nail. It doesn't take but a few seconds to, uh, okay. to try. And Mo's actually wearing them right now. If you want to look. Um, and they come in all different colors. Exactly, all kinds of different. Um, and so some people might have trouble putting these on their cats if their cats are a little testy or finicky. Um, well, most vets kind of help them out with that and apply them for them. Exactly. We can usually do them. You know, we have two people more experienced. You know, usually handling a cat, so we can we can often do them awake. Some cats um, do require. Um, a little bit of light sedation. So that's all obviously an option too. And what actually is entailed in the declaw procedure? So it's not like just cutting your nails. Exactly, okay. exactly. So a lot of people, and even the, the name, so um, a declaw procedure, um, the real name is called an onchiectomy, and that's really, all that means is claw removal, and it's really not a good, a good name for the procedure. Essentially what we're doing is we're actually taking the, the end um, of the, the last bone of each digit. Okay. So we essentially the best way to do the procedure, and the most acceptable way, is to uh, make an incision at that jo on that joint capsule. Mm -hmm. So you want to make an incision into that, that joint and then we actually dissect out that first bone, so that first phalanx. Um, after the procedure we do put glue into those incision sites and then go ahead and bandage um, each, each foot. Okay. Uh, to prevent some self-trauma. So if you do get your cat declawed, what are some things you need to keep in mind when you bring the cat home or sure. um, special things you may need to do around the house it's, to keep him safe? That's our, that's, I said that's one of the biggest issues we have with declaws is people don't understand exactly what's intended. They think it's just their claw, you know, cutting their claws, but they are actually removing that first bone. So there are incision sites. We usually wrap them for a day. A lot of times we encourage owners to leave the cat with us overnight just so mm -hmm. that they're, they're um, in, a, in, a, in a confined environment. Mm -hmm. Or I'll recommend owners um, when they take them home to put them in a bathroom, a kennel, something so that they're not really active, you know, because they are using these, you know, they use these to walk. So um, usually they can remove the bandages after a couple days, um, but pain control is the biggest, the biggest thing we, we really encourage. So um, there are, there used to not be a lot of good pain options for cats. We have great pain medications now. Uh, they can eat that, an injection of an opiate that lasts 24 hours. They can return to the clinic, get another one if they need it. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming oh, thank you so much on for having giving me. us some details about that. We thank really you so appreciate much. it. Shopping for food for your dog or cat can be a frustrating experience with dozens of brands on the shelves and different types to choose from. To help you make the right choices, I spoke with Brittany Gillum, Director of Operations at Hollywood Feed. If you have a pet, one of the most confusing things in the world is getting food. 
how do you wade through all this? <laughs> it can be really confusing. Um, it, it can be very overwhelming. There's a lot of conflicting information out there. Um, I would say one of the best things to do and to start off with, just flip over that bag and read the ingredients on the back of that bag. You'll start seeing things in there that you go, wow, why is that in my dog food? Why is there sugar in my dog food? Why is there BHA and BHT, um, artificial preservatives that are known to be cancer causing? You know, um, Why are there dyes in my dog food that are known to be cancer causing? And you'll start having your eyes opened up to, wow, th this is not going to be healthy for my dog. I need to look for another alternative. Um, research the brands you're looking at online. Do they have any recalls? Um, you know, look on the FDA site. Have they had any active FDA recalls? Do they have any current lawsuits, you know, where people are seeing concerns with this food and how it's affecting their dogs? So, you know, those are the two most basic things you can start out with just at the beginning. My wife and I discuss this all the time, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, I our dogs uh, have teeth issues mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. should you feed something that's dry to mm -hmm. help kind of scrape their teeth mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a canned food, a mm -hmm. moist food for dogs? For dogs, if, for dogs um, really and truly it's going to have more about the ingredients in the food. If, if there's sugar in the food or high carbohydrates, that's what sticks in there and causes cavities and things like that. Okay. So um, it's less canned versus dry and more what is your carbohydrate and sugar content. Either way, dogs, they're prone to dental problems, so I highly <laughs> suggest you know, doing those treats that help to clean the teeth, things like that. Um, it, it's going to have way more to do with the actual ingredients in the food. There's going to be a little bit of that scraping with the dry, but not enough to make a huge difference like a dental treat would. Let, let's talk cats. Cats, mm -hmm. dry is not good. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, moist is better when it comes to cat food. I would say that dry is not good, but I would definitely say moist is ideal. We really encourage our cat customers to have a lot of canned food in the cat's diet. Cats are very prone to kidney, kidney renal issues, things like that. So the more moisture you can push through the system, the better. You know, canned food is anywhere from 70 to 80 percent moisture. So you're really going to help the cat's water intake by giving them more canned food. Um, and you can, there's a lot of research on that as well. You do some mm -hmm. internet research talk mm -hmm. to your vet mm -hmm. and you go to a reliable mm -hmm. source mm -hmm. so somebody at at, at the store that you yeah. feel comfortable yeah uh, but how do you know that they know what they're talking mm -hmm. about really and truly it's going to be using best judgment you know speak to your veterinarian come to your local um, trusted pet food experts um, like us or if you live somewhere else you know find someone that you know is educated that gets that current education that you can trust and look online the other thing I suggest doing is you know do a little bit of research for yourself one thing that I did last night um, before I came in to prepare was I took um, a basic food that has a lot of undesirable ingredients in it and then a food we carried and I wanted to see which one um, was heavier because to me this is both the same volume but which one's denser so I actually weighed the grocery store one and it came out at 312 grams where the one we weigh or our food it came out at 406 grams and it's the same volume the kibble's denser there's more nutrition and I actually looked up the calories and there's a hundred more calories per cup than this. So this may be a little bit more expensive, but you're getting a much, much better deal per pound with this than you are this. Okay, let's shift gears, yeah. whether it's cat or dogs. The uh, If you go in, you've got, okay, if this is for puppies, this is for mm -hmm. one to six years old. Are those just gimmicks or are they actually something you, you mm -hmm. should consider? I will say that, and unfortunately, some are just gimmicks and others are, you really, this food is actually made for a senior or actually made for a puppy. Unfortunately, a lot of brands out there, if you flip over that bag, the puppy and adult look exactly the same. Whereas there's others where it's actually nutritionally formulated for a large breed dog, which is really important, or a large breed puppy, excuse me, which is really important because when they grow, they grow to be a lot bigger. The calcium and phosphorus, it's really important that they get the proper amounts of that. So really and truly doing your research, sometimes it's really necessary for you to be breed specific, you know, overweight dogs, growing dogs, puppies, large breed puppies, um, where other times it doesn't matter if your, you know, German Shepherd and your Labrador eat the same food. You know, they have those breed specific ones mm -hmm. out there. That's not going to be near as big of an issue as a growing Mastiff versus an adult Mastiff. Those are two completely different nutrition profiles. Well, let's talk treats. Yep. Uh, 
uh, not all treats are the same. Again, you want to flip over that bag. The big thing with treats is look at where they're made. Um, you know, unfortunately, and I know there's been a lot of talk about this, but I, I like to drive at home. There's a lot of treats made in China that very questionable. They have very minimal regulations over there on, you know, what is named a certain protein. You don't know if beef is really beef or if chicken is really chicken, <laughs> you know, which is unfortunate. Um, so you want to you want to look at what's in that treat. You know, so there are plenty of healthy treats that dogs love. Um, there's dehydrated meat jerky that is going to be great for them, you know, that is all going to be U.S. resourced. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. And there are a lot of biscuits out there that can be healthy as well, as long as you're keeping in thought, you know, how many calories, things like that, because overweight on dogs causes a lot of issues with hip and joint. Brittany Gillum, thank you very much for Thanks taking for time us. to share a vast amount of knowledge about a, a vast array of dog foods and cat foods. Anytime. That's all for this edition of Your Family Pet. We'll have more interesting stories about the animals we love next month. Thanks for watching. Join us in April for more of Your Family Pet. Production funding for Your Family Pet is made possible in part by Memphis Veterinary Specialists, a referral-based specialty hospital serving the needs of small animals, offering diagnostic tools and treatment options not typically found outside veterinary teaching hospitals, including orthopedic and neurologic surgery, oncology, dermatology, dentistry, ophthalmology, internal medicine, and more. And by viewers like you. Thank you.